Hello, teachers, students, uh, educators, and explorers. Welcome to another episode of Classroom Explorer, Explore Classroom. Um, here today we have Jamina, and she's visiting with her team from far away in Cabo San Lucas. And while there's a lot of noise going on, um, thank you so much for joining. I know it's not an easy situation to be in. Um, I'd like to encourage the educators watching to check out more of our stuff that we've got going on at National Geographic Education, which you can reach at natgeoed.org, as well as the National Geographic Education Facebook that we have. And you can just search that straight into the Facebook bar. Um, during this um, Explore Classroom, feel free to tweet um, using the hashtag, um, hashtag Let's Explore. Um, also include a question, your name, uh, the school and where you're uh, tweeting from, and we'll try and get your classrooms your classrooms incorporated into the rest of this program. Um, yeah, so thanks so much for joining. I'm going to hand it over to Joe now. All right. Well, thanks everyone for joining in today. I'm looking forward to another awesome Explorer classroom session. Um, so just a little bit of an intro uh, for Jamina uh, Garland Lewis. She's a biologist, photographer, and explorer with experience in 28 countries across six continents. She worked as a trip leader uh, and photography teacher for high school students with Nat Geo Student Expeditions for four years. And in 2012, received a National Geographic Young Explorers Grant. And so her focus uh, in both research and art is the connection between humans, animals, and the environment. So she's joining us right now from Cabo San Lucas with two of her teammates um, on October, August 14, 2016. Um, aboard the Halcyon, they sailed uh, from Seattle um, for a multi-year adventure sailing the Pacific. So they've been to Vancouver Island along the western coast of the U.S. and later we'll be heading uh, down through Central America. So the journey will highlight what adventurers can do as citizen scientists to inspire classrooms and readers to consider their own role in ocean conservation, offer tools for them to engage in a tangible and meaningful way on some of the most pressing marine environmental issues. So Jamina, it's so good to have you joining us today with your team, and I know you can give them a, an intro for me, and uh, we're excited to hear about the journey so far. Great, thank you so much, Joe, for, uh, for the introduction here. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and let John and Becca introduce themselves um, just briefly. That was a great intro, thank you for that on my end. Um, and maybe just quick uh, who you are, and then a little bit later we can go into more um, you know, the idea behind this big expedition that you guys are on um, and why you're out here. Sure. So uh, my name is Becca and this is my husband, John. And um, we started sailing about eight years ago and then bought a boat and decided that with our boat, we really wanted to go explore the world. So in August, we left and we've been traveling down the coast for the last few months. Um, we move at about six miles an hour. So that is about the speed that you can run around a track uh, or run down the street. That's about as fast as we are exploring the world. So it's nice and slow and we have to wait for good weather so that we can leave and go to our next place. So we spend a lot of time looking around underwater and above water uh, meeting new people, exploring new cultures, and uh, enjoying what's out there. Uh, my name is John. Um, one of the things that uh, we're really excited about uh, is uh, taking the boat to exotic places that haven't really been uh, haven't been explored fully, um, and using citizen science, both uh, ourselves uh, working on projects and also uh, allowing Halcyon to be a platform for other citizens to, uh, to, to do their work, to extend their projects. Um, so very excited about that. Uh, some of the stuff we've done in the past is go up to uh, British Columbia on the central coast of British Columbia in a place called the Great Bear Rainforest. Uh, and we have worked on salmon streams, documenting uh, wolves and bears along, along that area with an organization called Pacific Wild. Uh, and Halcyon has also taken us up to Alaska uh, to uh, work with some explorers up there, uh, documenting uh, some mining activity. So uh, we're excited to keep moving forward with uh, with some of this stuff. And from there, we'll turn it back over to Jamina. All right. Thank you, guys. Um, so, yeah, so I'll just give another uh, quick introduction about sort of... Um, uh, my work in general. So um, as you guys heard, I am a photographer and biologist um, and explorer. Um, I also am a, a scientist. I work in a field called One Health or Eco Health. And what that means is that I look at issues 
um, about health and disease, uh, where humans, animals, uh, and the environment all intersect. So sometimes that means I look at issues like a disease that can get transferred from an animal to a person, but that also means that I look at things um, like pollutants in the environment that can cause negative health issues for both wildlife and for uh, humans as well. And so uh, what we're going to be talking to you guys about today is sort of one of uh, that last issue, something that's uh, polluting the environment that can cause health issues for people and animals. And that issue that we've been uh, working on here the last uh, few months on Halcyon is about microplastics in the ocean. Um, and I'll talk more about microplastics in a little while to give some more detail. Um, but for right now, all you need to know is that they're like, it's, like they sound really teeny tiny little plastics, uh, smaller than your fingernail and they're floating all over the ocean. And this is something that I first got um, interested in and first started working on almost 10 years ago now, um, when I first learned to sail. Um, the sailboat that I was on, we sailed across the Pacific um, from Tahiti to Hawaii, and we were collecting microplastics during that whole time. And so I got to see them up close and see um, how far of an area they cover and just really, um, you know, what, what's out there kind of, it seems like in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of the ocean, um, you know, that's making its way all the way from the plastic water bottle that we drink in out uh, into uh, being eaten by a fish in the middle of the Pacific. Um, and so um, I knew about this issue and I'd worked on it. And so when John and Becca started telling me about um, the expedition that they wanted to go on, that they just talked about, um, going for a couple years exploring all these different places um, but saying that they wanted to have uh, you know more involvement like with citizen science this was something that I thought would be a great platform uh, for them to start with because you can um, do the collection really easily on board the boat and it's a really important issue um, and so one thing that's important is that even though I have worked on this before um, and I am a scientist it's not some, this, this topic, microplastics, is not what I focus on every day of my life, like some other scientists do. Um, and why that's important is because one of the things we want to talk to you guys about today is citizen science or adventure science, which means that even if you're not a scientist or even if you're a scientist who doesn't put all their um, work into a certain topic, you can still help out with that research and still do really important things. Um, and that's a really great thing to remember when you're off adventuring or if you're just in your own hometown exploring. There's always a way that you can get involved. Um, so that's something that we want to share with you guys today, too. Um, so I don't know, is there anything else, John and Becky, you want to say about um, uh, sort of our initial conversations about why you wanted to, to do more than just explore and, and get involved um, with some of the issues like these? Yeah, um, as I mentioned before, we've been involved in um, a couple of different expeditions um, that have all been central around water. Um, obviously, being a sailboat, water is very important to us, um, as is weather. Um, so when uh, Jamina and, uh, and the two of us started discussing um, potential product uh, or projects, um, uh, microplastics was a really important one. Uh, it obviously, we, we all feel that it's... Uh, Plastics and other pollutants in the water are one of the greatest, uh, are one of the greatest detriments to uh, to the marine ecosystem, uh, and so we wanted to have some type of impact. And uh, one of the best ways to impact that is through uh, exposing that truth. Uh, and while uh, Becca and I aren't scientists ourselves, um, we wanted to uh, we wanted to put that information in the hands of scientists who uh, weren't. Uh, as fortunate or just weren't as uh, able to be in the places uh, that we would be able to be in. And it is, um, it's, for us, it's really hard not to do anything about it because we see the effects of it every single day. As we're sailing down the coast, we see plastic bottles in the water. We see plastic bags caught on the rocks and the shore. We see wildlife that are um, struggling because there's so much plastic in the water. So. It was important for us to draw the attention to it because we see it every day. A lot of other people don't get to see that every day. Um, and so this is one way for us to uh, bring that awareness to other people. 
So, yeah, so um, I'll talk a little bit more about what microplastics are so you guys know what we're talking about here. But um, again, they're, they're very, very small plastics, uh, you know, just less than five millimeters, so really, really tiny. Um, and we find them all over the ocean. Everywhere that has ever been sampled, we find little pieces of plastic. Doesn't matter if it's the uh, surface of the ocean where most of the sampling is done, if it's the bottom of the ocean in deep sea sediment or in uh, even in the sea ice in Antarctica and the Arctic, we find plastic everywhere. Um, and we think that it's about uh, 100 to 250,000 metric tons, which is such a big number that it's kind of meaningless, right? Um, so there's just tons of plastic, and it's possible that in the next uh, 30 years, there's going to be more plastic in the oceans than fish, which is a really crazy thing to think about, and that's by the weight of all the plastic, um, and that's a really scary thing to think about, too, which is one of the reasons that we're out here doing this. Can y'all imagine going to the seaside and seeing more plastic than fish? Don't want to do that. Um, so... Uh, one, one of the ways that, um, well, let me, first, why is it bad? We all know that plastic is bad, but we don't actually um, we always know why that is. We, we know that plastic is bad. So basically what happens is there's two ways that microplastics um, can occur. One is that they're already small. Some plastics are already small. You can find things like um, in beauty products, like a face wash or some makeup, even uh, even some toothpaste has little tiny plastics in it. They usually are there to help scrub, um, and those can get washed out into the ocean. Um, another way that they can form is through the bigger plastics, uh, like soda bottles. Um, those, uh, or you know, to-go packaging from your restaurant food, that can all get washed out to the ocean. Um, even though we do our best to recycle, a lot of it still makes its way to the ocean. And then over time, as the sunlight hits it, and as the waves hit it, and as wildlife coming by tries to eat it, over time, the bigger plastics all get broken down and broken down into these smaller and smaller pieces. Um, and there's already uh, chemicals and toxins in the plastic that are um, just from how it's made. But another thing is that these plastics actually attract other pollutants that are in the water. And so they sort of accumulate even more toxins than they already started with. Um, and then these little plastics look like food to a lot of different creatures. And so they start to eat them. Um, and then that, uh, well, those toxins on the plastic can get into their gut and eventually into their bloodstream. Um, and then a bigger fish will come and eat that fish. And then it actually accumulates even more in that fish and up and up and up so the top of the food chain fish have really uh, dangerous levels of, of toxins from um, all of these levels of eating fish that have had plastic in them um, and so it can change things um, like uh, uh, sort of the success rate of how many fish hatch so fish that um, are fish eggs in water with a lot of plastic not as many of the eggs will hatch those that do end up hatching um, are generally smaller in size, and they're often slower than fish that are uh, hatched in water that doesn't have a lot of plastic. And um, they're also a little bit um, not as smart. Um, and when we say that, we mean that they are not as good at avoiding their predators. Um, so plastic can really change the way that um, the whole fish lives its life. And those and are just the things that we know about. Those are just the things that we know about, exactly. Um, and this is still, you know, we're learning new things all the time about this. Um, and then, of course, for bigger plastics, uh, as Becca was saying, an animal could get entangled or it could swallow it. Plastic bags look a lot like jellyfish to a sea turtle. And sea turtles love to eat jellyfish. And so sometimes they end up eating plastic bags. Um, and that can clog their gut, they can die of starvation, all sorts of really terrible things. Um, so that's why they're bad. And so how do we measure them? How do we collect them, especially when they're tiny? So there are two main ways. The most common way is that you drag a net. It's uh, called a plankton net or a noosten net or a manta net. There's different names, but it's a really big net that has a really wide mouth and a narrow opening like that. And 
um, you drag it along the side of your boat. The bottom part of the nut is under the water and the top part is above the water. So you're just sort of skimming the surface. Um, and you do that, it's called a trawl, and you do that for however long you want. And then you pull up the nut and you sort of invert it and then rinse it out with water and all the little plastic pieces you've collected um, will come out of that. Um, and that's how most of the measurements are done. Another way that you can do it, which is the way that we've been doing it so far on Halcyon's journey, um, is that you can collect a water sample. And then you can send that water sample um, back to somebody else who will then do the counting. And so that's um, one of the important parts about citizen science here is we're collecting water samples um, and I'll tell you guys about how we do that, and then we send them back to the, the scientist whose focus is on this back in Maine. Um, so what we'll do um, to collect these water samples um, is we actually have to bring the boat to a stop, um, and we try to do it in uh, different parts of the water. So we might wanna do it really far offshore, and then we wanna do it right in the bay where we're at, um, and then somewhere in the middle so that we can see maybe how the plastics change as we get closer or farther away from shore. Um, and we stop and we get a big old bucket and we get water in that bucket, we rinse it, and then we have a, a one liter water bottle that we rinse that in that water. Um, and one thing we have to be really careful about um, is the type of clothing that we wear. Um, I forgot to mention this before, but another way that you can find um, microplastics is through our clothing. And we call them microfibers if they're in our clothing, but it's the same sort of issue. So uh, that can be found in almost anything that's uh, uh, nylon or um, like your, if you have a fleece coat that you wear when it's cold outside, all those little fuzzies on it, those are all microfibers. And when you wash those, those can get um, out to the ocean as well, and they cause the same kind of problems. Um, not to mean that you don't need a fleece coat when it's cold outside, but just know this is uh, one, one of the ways that they happen. Um, and so we have to be careful what clothing we wear when we collect the sample because we don't want to mess up the sample um, by having something from our own coat get into the water um, because then um, it's not a good... Um, representation of what's actually in the water where we're sampling. So we gotta be careful about what we wear. And then we get that sample, we get a label on it, um, and we note things like you know, our, our GPS, so where are we in the world, how deep is the water, um, what, how strong is the wind, and what direction is it coming from, because wind plays a really big role in how plastics are distributed throughout the ocean, so it's good to know that information. Um, and then we get it to somewhere when we find a post office, which are few and far between when you live on a sailboat, um, we can send that back to the researcher who um, is studying this. Um, and then she tells us what results we have. So John and Becca um, uh, were sampling for a few months before I actually joined them. Um, and so we just got those results back and uh, pretty much almost all of our samples except two had some sort of plastic in them. Um, and so you can see that, um, like we said, they're just kind of everywhere. Um, you may, can you, okay, all right. This may, we may die out in a second, but we'll come back. <laughs> um, all right, so that's most of the nitty gritty about the microplastics. Um, and so we had been wanting to, I'd hoped to have a net to do some of the microplastic sampling to show you guys today what they actually look like. Um, but unfortunately, we aren't the people that were going to give us a net weren't able to do it in time. So I don't have any of that to share with you guys today. I'm sorry about that. Um, but it's just a reminder that sometimes on expeditions, things don't always go the way that you think they will, and you do the best that you can anyway. Um, Impro improvise. Improvise is always key. Yes, always important on expedition. Um, and so uh, that's a lot of. Um, sort of sad stuff, <laughs> um, and, you know, and, but there's good news too. And the good news is that um, when we talk about plastics pollution, um, there's actually something that can be done about it. And there's something that can be done by every single one of us, no matter how old you are or where you live. 
um, and it's relatively easy and it doesn't really cost you much either, which is great because that is not the case with um, some of the other environmental issues that we face. This is something that um, you really can make a difference at, and I think that's what's really important about sharing um, sharing information about microplastics because then people can actually try to make a difference in their own life as well. Um, so some of the things that you can do, um, you know, some of the most obvious ones are just reducing um, your use and disposable plastic. And that's actually the most important one too. While it's good to recycle and while it's good to use things that might, um, uh, that are biodegradable or compostable, like some of the new uh, uh, dishware um, is coming out, a lot of biodegradable stuff, that's all great, but still the most important thing is to just reduce our use of disposable um, items like that. So instead of buying a water bottle that you're gonna throw away or recycle, get one that you can refill um, and make sure that your school has water fountains um, or a water refilling station in your classroom so that you always have access um, to do that and you don't have to buy another water bottle. Um, those little caps on disposable water bottles are one of the really big problems for seabirds because they look a lot like food to seabirds. Um, so if you can have something that has that lid attached, that's also really great. Um, and then another one is not using plastic bags when you go shopping. Um, again, the best thing is to bring your own bags from home that you can reuse. Um, although if you don't have that, you can always get the paper bag as well. Um, but that's a really important one as well. There are um, a number of other things that are good to check out. Um, there's a, a list called the Plastics Ban List, B-A-N, and it stands for Better Alternatives Now. And that is just a really nice little way of summarizing um, what are the worst problems for plastics pollution in the ocean and giving you um, an easy alternative of a way to, to switch it out for something better. So I would encourage all of you guys or your teachers or your parents to look at the plastics ban list um, and see maybe what changes you could make um, in your own life, in your house or at school. Um, another way is to get involved, like we are on this expedition with um, citizen science or adventure science. And there are a number that um, you can use um, or you can get involved in um, in your own area. If any of you happen to be in Montana, um, there is uh, the organization we work with, Adventure Scientists. Um, they have a project on the Gallatin River in Montana, which is a really important microplastics project there locally. Um, but they have a lot of other cool ways to get involved in different projects. So you should just check them out in general. They're a really great organization. Um, another thing, if um, any of you guys um, are using or your parents are using um, a smartphone. There's an app called Literati. Um, it's L-I-T-T-E-R-A-T-I. And that is an app that allows you to uh, map where you find plastic and where you clean it up. And you can take pictures and make notes. And there's researchers behind that app who are um, tracking all of the data that citizens um, are putting in there so they know sort of um, if, if there's a particular brand that seems to be ending up um, uh, a lot that people are finding or what type of bottles or containers, anything like that. And you can um, really help out that organization as well just by tracking what plastics you find and then taking it to a recycling plant. Um, and then just in general, if you, you know, microplastics might not be the most interesting thing in the world to you, but there are lots of other citizen science projects as well that you can get involved in to help look at, uh, there are a number that look at seabirds, so if you live on a coast, you can find some uh, ways to help uh, sort of do beach walks and make notes about seabirds. Um, and you know, just look and see where you can get involved um, in your own community. There's definitely something that you can help out with um, with your family or with your classroom for sure. Um, and I do have some pictures to share with you guys about our um, adventure here. Uh, let me see if I can get this to work before my battery dies because you don't have the pictures. Sure. Um, so like, um, 
click the, the share screen and then pick the first option to do your whole desktop. That usually works best. Okay. Thank you, Joe. No worries. Um, I'll say while you're loading up that I'm very jealous of the color that the three of you have. I can see <laughs> going a little bit of uh, a little bit of sun. We're, we just had our first snow here in Canada, so. Oh <laughs> yeah, you're in Canada then. <laughs> That'll do it. Um, all right, can you see my screen? Yep. Okay. Oh. Um, so let's see. I'll, I'll just add that uh, the, the brown color comes with the red. So kids That's wear true. sunscreen. Sunscreen is a whole other <laughs> thing important. we can talk about. <laughs> um, while we're on that note, I will say you should, if you are an ocean adventurer, you should look at the types of sunscreen that are uh, safe for coral reefs. Um, because there's a lot of sunscreens that can actually do, um, can kill the coral reefs as well. And um, that's another real simple way just by changing what product you buy that you can have a big impact on marine conservation. Um, yeah, okay. All right, let's see how far we get here. So um, this is just a map I just wanted to share with you guys. As Joe said, um, this is the, the track that Halcyon has been on. So um, John and Becca left in August, and they went up and around uh, Vancouver Island and down the West Coast. I actually joined them somewhere right about here in Santa Barbara, and now we are down here at the bottom of this red arrow, um, at the bottom of the Baja Peninsula. And they'll continue on down to Central and South America, across the Pacific, and then they're going to go any which way in here. We don't know. That's why there's a lot of arrows. That's why they call it adventure. Exactly. You can only plan so far in advance. Um, so that's this the track that we're on right now. Um, so they have a lot of adventure and exploring and citizen science to do while they're out there. And this is uh, the boat that we're on, um, Halcyon. Um, sorry, it's moving. Um, she is about 40, or she is 40 feet long. Um, and that's about the size of a school bus to give you guys a good idea, sort of, of, uh, of what we're working on. So this is their house. This is where they live. Um, so down below what you can see here is a kitchen and a little bedroom and uh, couches and a table. Um, so this is where we live and do the, the research off the side of the boat here. Um, this is just some of the water sampling that I was talking about. This is John here rinsing the bucket to, um, to get that water sample ready to go. And here, another view of that, just getting that ready. Um, and then we have to rinse these bottles out just to make sure there's nothing remaining in them. So that's what we're doing here. And this is Becca uh, logging that information. It's an app that we use called Liquid. Um, and it's uh, specifically built with the scientists who we send these to in Maine. Um, for us to track all that information that I was mentioning about where we are and weather conditions and water conditions and all of that. So we do that as soon as we uh, take the sample, um, get that uh, information uploaded to them. And this is uh, Adventure Scientist. This is the map. Um, this is who we work with. So these are all these dots, all the orange ones are places all over the world where somebody has taken a sample for them and it, they've found plastic in that sample. And the size of the circle um, is about how much plastic there is. So the bigger the plastic, uh, the more plastic in the sample, the bigger the circle. Um, and then the uh, yellow circles, which are actually kind of hard to see because there's so few of them, are where the samples didn't have any plastic in them. And then the purple ones um, are just, they're still waiting back they're still in the lab um, so you can see that pretty much anywhere that anyone has done a sample um, they have found these little plastics in them and so we're helping to fill out this map um, with some of our sampling as well and this is just a pretty picture of our boat to end on so um, you guys can kind of see um, what she looks like with our sails up when we're underway um, and I think that was most of the pictures that I wanted to, to share with you guys. Oh, there's some more over here, actually. Look at that. <laughs> I don't know why they separated. Um, so, yeah, I wanted to just share uh, this picture and um, the one below. Um, 
just to see these beautiful places that we're in and then you can always sort of find the plastic in it in the end. Um, and so like Becca was saying, we have a unique opportunity here um, going to these really remote places, um, seeing so much of the world and seeing also how much plastic there is in all of these places. Um, and so it really just uh, changes changes the view, changes the landscape of these places that we're at. Yeah, one of the one of the kind of frightening, interesting but frightening things to add is uh, we we've been to some very very remote places, places that are a uh, hundred miles from any civilization, and every beach that we've landed on has had some sort of plastic on it. Um, so just just a kind of a frightening thing to think about. It the vast majority of beaches that are out there um, have have plastic ashore um, without a population nearby. All right, so I can see by All your right. screen we're going to lose you very shortly. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and switch over. I've got my computer here as well. Yeah, we can switch over, over to, to John. To John. John. Oh, there we go. It worked. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we can so we can, that, that work. Um, also, also, I can, I can sign, sign out here, and we can use his computer to do the question section. Does that sound good? Sounds good to me. All right, All perfect. Right, perfect. Then, then let me get, get out of here, and we'll see you in one second. We have this echo. All right, John, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, can you hear us? Yeah, we just don't have your picture. Your camera might be turned off. Uh-huh, okay, let's fix that. We are we are looking quite, uh, quite hairy than normal. <laughs> I don't know. It looks uh, looks like some, some nice sun. I'd love to feel a little bit of that for a few minutes. Well, how about, uh, so I need to do some work to get the camera working. Uh, can we take questions uh, without the camera? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Okay. So I'll introduce the classrooms, and we'll steal a couple of questions from each classroom. And I just want to add, too, the group you're working with, Adventure um, Scientists. They are a really cool group, and I've hosted their uh, founder, Greg, a few times for Google Hangouts. And so they're definitely a group worth checking out. Yeah, he's a great guy. So. All yeah. right. Let's jump into a classroom. So let's start off with Mrs. Rose, grade threes in Renfrew, Ontario. Let me turn your microphone on and you can go ahead with a couple questions. Hello. 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 We've collected plastic from the water by our school, but there's always more. Okay, and Alex has asked a question. Have you ever rescued animals from the plastic? Um, so that's a really good question. Um, and we, are, we have not done that on our own um, because the best thing to do if you see that is to um, figure out what number to call. Um, usually for whatever area you live in, there's um, a, some sort of organization that will, that's kind of their job, is they go out um, when an animal is, is entangled in plastic or struggling and they, um, they have special tools um, that they can use to get that animal free. And it's, it's really hard because um, you want to help, you want to do everything that you can um, if you see an animal like that. But you have to remember that if it's not your job, if you don't exactly know what you're doing, you are probably going to end up causing that animal more stress and more harm um, by going up to it. And um, you know they don't they don't know what you're there to do. So you're kind of just an extra scary thing sometimes. And so that's why the people. Who are trained to do this have special tools to help it out. Um, so you can look at, they're usually marine mammals, stranding networks, or uh, entanglement, animal entanglement um, uh, numbers that you can call and somebody can always pick up and you can tell them where you've seen that. Um, but yeah, even though you want to do everything you can to help, sometimes the best thing you can do to help is to, to call the people who know what to do best um, yep. instead of trying to make it yourself that's a great great question though it's a really great question um, and um, for the first girl um, who had a comment about how there's always more plastic 
It's true, and that's something that can really can really uh, weigh you down. But that's why um, what I was saying about the most important thing being to reduce how much we use plastic in our own lives. So instead of increasing recycling, um, whatever steps we can make to reduce how much plastic that's um, that we throw out or recycle, that's the biggest step, and then that'll help decrease over time how many. Uh, plastic we see in the water. Um, but both things have to go hand in hand. You have to reduce how much you use and you have to keep cleaning it up and just know that over time those two things together will make a difference. All right. All right. Great question. Great question. Um, um, let's jump to Mrs. Utsonomia's class in Surrey, British Columbia. They're a grade six, seven class. Let me turn your microphone on. There we go. A whole new ecosystem friendly material that could replace plastic and all? Um, that's a great idea. Um, and I know that people are working hard to do that. And so some of the things um, that are starting to replace plastics um, are biodegradable or compostable. Um, and we make them from usually from corn, um, sometimes other, other products. Um, and that's a great step. That's a really great step because no matter um, no matter what, we will always have disposable packaging of some kind. And so if that packaging can be biodegradable um, and not made of plastic, that's really important. But again, the, the most important and the most effective thing is to not be dependent on things that we have to throw away. So we really have to get better about reusing things um, that are meant to be reused time and time again, rather than depending on things that are we're going to throw away after we use them one time. So it's great. It's great to, to see more and more of these things that will biodegrade, um, replacing plastics, and we definitely need more of that. Um, but yeah, the more that you can do to, to not use any of that disposable stuff is the best thing. Thank you. All right, let's grab one more. Uh, oh, another question from us? Yeah. Okay. Well, are most affected and by microplastics? Can you repeat your question? Sorry, I didn't hear the first part of it. What animals are most affected by microplastics? That is a great question. Um, and so the animals for microplastics, the little teeny tiny ones, um, it's usually fish, um, smaller fish that um, are the first ones to eat it. And so it affects them first because they think it's food. And there's actually some, some new research that is showing that uh, fish, young fish, like teenager fish, um, actually prefer plastic to the, the food that they normally eat. And so something about the chemicals in that is sort of triggering something in their brain, kind of like when we eat a lot of junk food. You eat the whole bag of potato chips and you know it's not good for you, but you can't stop anyway. Um, it sounds like um, some of these plastics are having the same effect on fish, and so they're starting to eat more plastic than their actual the food that they need to survive. And so that can happen. That's a big impact on some of the smaller fish. But then what happens is the bigger fish eats the smaller fish, and then a bigger fish eats that fish, and it keeps going up. And because of the way... Um, that a toxin can exist in your body, it actually gets more and more concentrated higher up the food chain. So the biggest fish who's eaten, the bigger fish that's eaten, the one that's smaller who ate the one that's smaller, you know, all the way down, the one that's on the top of that food chain, he actually might suffer the most from the effects of the toxins in the plastic because of the way they accumulate. And then what happens next is that it affects humans too. And so I started out um, our conversation by saying that I, I look at issues that affect both people and animals together. 
And, you know, a lot of people, most of the people in this world eat seafood. And so we have found uh, plastics in our seafood as well. There are some researchers who are testing uh, fish, all different types of fish and oysters um, that are in our seafood markets. And they're finding those microplastics and those microfibers in our food as well. So it can end up affecting people as well. So um, there are all different ways that it, it can make an effect across all sorts of different types of, of um, animals in the ocean and to people who eat them too. All right, great questions. Uh, our next group is joining us from Freehold, New Jersey. They're a grade three class, Mrs. Castell's group. Uh, let me turn your microphone on. There we go. Just stay on my There you go. Right there is perfect. Hello, Samantha. 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 Hello, so I from yeah from um from our samples um I think I'd have to look it up here um uh I think was it around and we haven't had those uh that data back yet have we um sorry I'm gonna figure this out for you um okay we had seven samples that we have um have our results back already for. Um, and it looks like it was um, our fourth sample, and it had four pieces of plastic in it. And I'm going to guess that Northern California. Northern California. So that would have been uh, going into the San Francisco Bay, uh, surprisingly. Uh, so San Francisco, uh, the bay that surrounds uh, that city is a very shallow bay. And it has a lot of uh, population density uh, that, that surrounds it. So there's a lot of trash that, that flows into the San Francisco Bay, and it stays shallow, and it all flows out. Uh, and we took that sample just probably a mile or two uh, outside of the bay. So all that current uh, kind of flew out of the bay, and we scooped up some of that plastic into our sample. All right. Great question. And one more if you have it. Riley, you want to Sure. Me? We're coming, sorry. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> About how many fish are killed by microplastics? Ooh. That's a tough question. So that's, that's one of the reasons why we're out here doing this research is nobody really knows. Um, you know, I think people can take a, an educated guess at it. I'm not sure that we can, um, but there, there's really no way of knowing yet. I was thinking no way of knowing. We don't know yet because we don't know how much plastic is really out there yet. And it's changing all the time. Yeah. So, so uh, we, there have been some, um, some people have estimated how much plastic exists in a certain type of, of fish species. So we, for one group of fish, we know the weight of how much plastic we think they're holding in their guts. Um, but one of the things that is hard, especially about microplastics, is that it doesn't necessarily um, uh, um, it doesn't necessarily cause a fish to die uh, right away. So, like I was saying, um, some of the effects can be that. Maybe just more fish aren't born, they don't survive, they're slower and um, smaller, so maybe um, they have a harder time making, um, reproducing uh, in the future, um, or maybe they get more, they caught, get caught by a predator more easily, so then um, it's hard because it changes, it changes everything about how fish, um, about how they function, about, you know, how, for however many millions of years fish have been existing this changes a lot of things about how they um, reproduce and how they eat and um, how they engage with with predators and so it's hard to to say for sure you know all of these fish are killed by plastics because 
what's probably going to happen is that it's more of a, an indirect uh, effect um, that's causing fish populations to decline because of plastic rather than the plastic directly killing the fish. So it gets really hard to estimate, like John was saying, and and people are trying to, to figure out these issues, but there's so many different ways that it can cause a problem that it's, it's hard to have an exact number for sure. But that's why what we're doing is so important. This, this really is one of the, uh, the uh, is is uh, is the frontier of of, of uh, environment science science. Uh, so it's important that we get that data so that we can figure out how many fish um, are affected, how many fish and how many birds and whales and and all these things are affected by plastic in the ocean and in humans. Yeah, yeah, and it's like John said, it's not just fish. It's it's birds and whales and dolphins and sea turtles and all sorts of different different animals. Um, that have problems with plastic. Thank you. All right, great questions from the grade three. So we are getting a little tight for time, so I'm going to make sure we visit the other three questions. We're gonna do one question from each class, and if we have time, we'll swing back um, for some follow-up. So I'm gonna to jump to Mrs. Silver's class in Canada, Ontario, and they're a grade three, four split class. Okay. Um, okay. How many do you get on average day, week, month, and year? How much plastic? <laughs> um so, so for us um, we are not sampling every single day, um, just because of some of the, the logistics that go with that. Um, but I can tell you that every, if we were to sample every day, we would find plastic every day. Um, so about, um, uh, so in the, yeah, cool. in the, in the seven samples that we've had analyzed so far, uh, we found, what was it, about, about 20, 25 uh, pieces of microplastics in those seven samples. So uh, that gives you a little bit of sense of a sense of how much plastic we're collecting. And these samples, keep in mind, these samples are two liters. So if you, if you times those, those seven small pieces by the amount of water that we captured and by the amount of water that's out there, uh, that's, that, a lot of that's a lot of plastic. That's a lot of plastic. So yeah, you could uh, you could definitely, if we were sampling every day, um, we would we would find it somewhere every day. Um, yeah. Oh, I'm not here. All right. Good question. So, Calgary, Alberta. You guys have a school, it's the same name as yours in Canada, Ontario. But I guess <laughs> you're a little further from me. Not quite as close. Um, Let's visit. We have a school joining us in Hawaii, Mrs. Bowman's group. They're a grade seven class, and your microphone is on. Your microphone is on. Yeah. What is the best part of your job? <laughs> what is the best part of your job? Right, right now, right now, we're, we're sitting in a beautiful uh, body of water uh, with palm trees all around us. I'd say the location of where we are is, uh, is I wouldn't say it's the best, but it's a, it's a big part of, uh, of the lifestyle. In my opinion, the best part of our job is that we get to explore new places every day. We're always in a new place, talking to new people, learning new stories, and having new adventures. At, at, those are both excellent, and they are... Those, favorite parts of, of mine as well. Um, I also think for me, um, it's really important to be, to be working towards something that is going to make um, our environment a, a healthier place um, for wildlife and for people, for both of us, for everybody. And so um, any way that I can help make that change happen um, and help some of these places that we have polluted any way to make that better and to make everybody to make everybody healthier uh, the environment humans and animals that makes me feel really good to know that um, I am making even just a little bit of positive difference um, as I do my work around the world 
yeah, there, there are a lot of animals out there that uh, are suffering because of the, uh, the things that we take for granted. Um, and I think, um, I think by having an impact on that, even if it's, if it's not a huge impact, having an impact at all uh, is a really valuable thing. So. Good question. Yeah. All right, good question and good answers. Our final group is joining us. Um, it's two classes, Mrs. Patokos and Mrs. Hollenbeck's. Uh, grade four from Kirksville, Missouri, and your microphone is should be on. Oh, I might need your teacher to turn on for me. It didn't work on my end. What is the farthest point you have ever traveled from North America? Ooh. Oh gosh! Oh, we're all gonna have different ones. Yeah. Uh, uh, I I lived in Australia. For about six months, I think that's about as far away as you can get from North America. Yeah, I uh, I lived in Australia as well, but I've I've lived a lot in um, different parts of southern and eastern Africa, um, which is very far away um, geographically, but also uh, very far away in terms of the culture that I was raised in. Um, <laughs> so, um, there than I do when I'm in Australia. And I'd say for me, it was uh, Western uh, Western Africa, so in Ghana. All right, awesome. Thanks for the question, guys. Um, so we're getting close to the end of our hangout. We're at about the hour mark. Where could classrooms follow along if they want to follow your adventures as they continue? Um, so we have a blog, um, we have a website where we document our adventures, and that is halcyonwandering.com, halcyonwandering, um, and so that's where you can follow along with us. Um, and also, if you are on Instagram, we use that hashtag, halcyonwandering, um, and you can, if you search for that hashtag, um, you can follow um, all sorts of um, anyone who uh, works with John and Becca, like myself, um, or if another scientist comes on uh, the boat for a little while, that hashtag will collect um, everybody's um, pictures that they're working on through Instagram. Um, and then to follow along on, on my work, um, uh, my website is um, just my name, JaminaGarlandLewis.com, and, and maybe there's a way for Joe to share that with the teachers. Um, and, um, yeah, that's, that's the best way to, to follow what, what I'm up to. So I've been on this, uh, this journey with them for the last month, um, sailing from Santa Barbara down here to, uh, Cabo San Lucas. Um, and then, uh, they're going to continue on, um, for who knows how many years here. Um, and I'll, I'll join in with them again, um, as that, as that time goes on, but I'm going to go off to do some other things for now. Um, so good to follow along, um, both of us. All right. Well, John, Becca, and Jamina, thank you so much for uh, joining us today. I know you just arrived in last night, so thank you for taking the time to, to find a connection for us. Um, I'm going to throw things back to Jordan for a moment at Nacho Education, and then we'll give the classrooms a chance to say goodbye and thank you. All right. Thanks, Joe. Um, to everyone, thank you for joining another episode of Explore Classroom. Had a lot of fun. Um, if you like this kind of content for educators that are interested in getting their kids to, you know, meet some of the explorers and get involved in the citizen science that Janina and her friends are talking about, check out Nat Geo Ed. We got lots of good stuff going on on natgeoed.org. And yeah, hand it back to Joe. All right. Awesome. Well, again, thank you for a great hangout. We look forward to following your adventures over the next few years. Um, as well, classrooms who are joining in, if you do have any further questions, you do have my email. So feel free to send them to me and I can forward them along. Thank you very much. All right. I'm going to turn on the microphones. We'll give the classrooms a chance to say goodbye and thank you and we'll sign out for today. Everybody say it. Oh. Bye. 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 Thank you, everybody, so much. All right. Thank you, everybody. We're signing off for today. All right. All right thank, thank you. you.